Hello and welcome. We are now several months into the Russo-Ukrainian war. There have been ongoing battles throughout the Donbass for the past two months. With the assault on Kyiv being driven back and Kharkiv Oblast liberated, the war has entered an attritional phase throughout the eastern region of the country. But I want to discuss something which hasn't been followed as closely, despite the memes of the ghost of Kyiv. Namely, the air war. And to do that, we need to look at how things stand currently. And as far as the news reports go, Russia's air campaign over Ukraine has been going... well... considering... Oh dear. When one considers the balance of forces, operational requirements, and sheer capability, the one area where Russia should have clearly and decisively dominated the Ukrainian defenders was the air, and yet even now, half a year since the commencement of hostilities, the airspace is still contested, which begs the simple question, how? But as the title suggests and the scope of these videos show, what, who, and why are just as important to answering this most basic of questions. Now I'm going to put out a massive disclaimer that everyone covering this war should be doing. Due to the nature of air operations in wartime, almost all the nitty gritty details and raw data is highly classified. What we do know is confirmed by OSINT sources, public releases from state actors, such as the Pentagon, Russian and Ukrainian ministries of defense, etc., or from primary sources on the ground in Ukraine and from the few fighter pilot interviews given by Ukrainian aviators. As for the presenter, myself, I am not a fighter pilot, nor am I a member of the Royal Australian Air Force. I am just a military historian whose obsession since age three has been combat aviation and war in the air. So while I have extensive academic knowledge, and my combat flight simulator hours are absolutely insane, I am not a professional in this field. But I do heavily draw from the expertise of real-life combat aviators who populate the online space, such as Mover, Gonki, Jello, and Mooch here on YouTube, who themselves have been discussing the air war and their perspective of the ongoing conflict. I also want to mention Chris from Military Aviation History, and my ever-hard-working friend and colleague Perrin. I highly recommend checking their videos out if for some weird reason you haven't already. Simply put, these videos' purpose is to give the average person a solid and easy to understand grasp on the air war. It involves the military doctrine of the combatants, the weapons they are using, how and why they are used the way they are, and how that has led to the current situation. For those familiar with modern air war and the methods of fighting it, or if you just want to know about the news and combat information, I suggest moving to the how and why video, which you can find here if I've done my YouTube due diligence correctly. But I would say that a cohesive understanding is important, so I do suggest you watch this one as well. Plus, I could use the watch time. Because despite all that has transpired and the intensity of the fighting on the ground, as it has been since 1939, the fight for the air remains the most vital component of modern war. If command of the air is denied to you, your tactical and strategic options are severely, if not decisively, limited. And if you are the invading or attacking force especially, this will almost certainly lead to your defeat. But before we can discuss any of that, we need to introduce our combatants. This section will focus on the order of battle, which units are involved, and what equipment they have. And given the circumstances, we will start with the Ukrainians, as they are the easier of the two to discuss, for the simple reason that their order of battle can be described as the Ukrainian Air Force. Simply put, this is a war for a national survival, and as such, the entirety of the nation's defense forces are active in resisting the invasion. But first, we will need to go over organizations and air defense doctrine. As per Soviet organization, which most post-Soviet states still broadly follow despite everything, with allowances for deviation and modernization, including Russia and Ukraine, air forces are organized into air armies positioned in support of military districts or ground formations which are in turn subdivided into regiments, then brigades. However, due to the relatively small size of the Ukrainian Air Force, they operate mostly exclusively in brigade strength, assigned to theater commands. The other major doctrinal difference one needs to consider when compared to the NATO formations most of you would be familiar with is that the Air Force is in charge of directing the majority of the air defense artillery assets, not the Army. Medium to long-range surface-to-air missiles and advanced anti-aircraft gun systems are under Air Force Theater Commands rather than Ground Forces Frontal Commands, forming the primary pillar around which the IADS, the Integrated Air Defense System, get ready for me to say that a lot, is built. 
Though it must be stressed that most frontline ground formations do have an organic air defense unit equipped with man portable air defense systems or man pads, as well as short to medium range surface to air missiles and anti aircraft artillery to counter close air support and helicopter threats independently. This is an anachronistic holdover from the Soviet era, where frontal aviation, those being fighters, bombers, and attack helicopters, were assigned to forward areas in conjunction with ground formations, while territorial air defense was assigned to an entirely separate command and control structure responsible for maintaining the Soviet IADs, the air defense forces, and they themselves had their own interceptor and missile brigades. Imagine the Coast Guard to the Navy just for air defense. They have a lot of the same gear and perform similar missions, but they have a distinctly different operational focus, and to facilitate this they have an entire separate chain of command. After the fall of the Soviet Union, however, these units were divided in responsibility between the armies and the air forces of their respective successor countries, and as stated before, shorter range weapon systems were deployed to the frontal units in the army, while longer range weapons and their protection elements were sent to the air force. Following on from that, there is the other major organizational and doctrinal structure in modern aerial warfare, and that is the aforementioned Integrated Air Defense System. An IADS can vary nation by nation based on its capabilities, doctrine and defense needs and their budget, etc, etc, but in simple terms, it is the cohesive organization of all counter-air assets for the purpose of restricting the activity of, and if possible, repelling enemy aircraft from your airspace, whether that be the frontline airspace all the way to your strategic interior. In practice, the first true IADS organization was RAF Fighter Command during World War II, which saw combat during the Battle of Britain in 1940. Using a network of radar stations and observation posts to plot the movement of German raids allowed for the efficient allocation of fighter squadrons to intercept and destroy the enemy. Since those early days, technology has changed the IADS into something ridiculously more lethal, namely the surface-to-air missile. During the Yom Kippur War of 1973, the Israeli Air Force, which had so decisively demolished the Arab coalition during the Six-Day War, was initially rendered impotent by the new generation of Soviet SAMs. Likewise, the all-conquering, all-powerful force of United States combat aviation, both Air Force and Navy, was held at bay to a significant degree by the Vietnamese Integrated Air Defense System, to the point that the entire modern concept of suppression of enemy air defense, or SEED, was born out of their experience encountering them, resulting in the accelerated development of anti-radiation missiles, dedicated SEED squadrons known as Wild Weasels, and expansive tactics to deal with surface-to-air threats. Fun fact. When the Wild Weasels were originally established, their reaction to their mission orders was adopted as their official motto, YGBSM. You've gotta be shitting me. Now, this history lesson may seem rather off topic and just me patting my ego and indulging in my YouTube history tendencies. And well, yeah, but it also gives you some background into how these systems evolved and why, which will help get across points later in this video and the next one, while also giving you an idea of what an IADS is comprised of. Speaking of, let's outline the basic conceptual construction of an IADS. Now, there are three main components of an IADS. Detection, coordination, prosecution. This starts with detecting the threat, then analyzing and plotting those threats, determining what the best response to those threats are, and then allocating assets to deal with them. Those assets then intercept, and if you are on a war footing or if it poses an imminent danger like a hijacked airliner, destroy the threat. In the making up of those components comes the following. Detection is comprised of medium to long range search radars, AWACS, drone reconnaissance, satellite tracking of enemy air bases or missile fields, and the good old-fashioned Mark I eyeball from ground or naval observers, be they military units or civilian volunteers. They feed information, real-time intelligence, and if possible, a raid count, that being the number of incoming threats, to the command and control network. The command and control network forms the coordination component and is usually based in a central air defense headquarters, although in the case of frontline air defense, due to the fast-paced nature of operations, they have their own organic command post on site to respond to immediate threats. They filter through the information and decide what asset to allocate to the incoming threat. The assets they have at their disposal are made up of overlapping systems for different roles. Short to medium range SAMs and anti-aircraft guns are for helicopters or low-flying frontal aviation threats. Medium to long range SAMs are for medium to high altitude threats. 
and fighters are deployed to intercept unidentified targets or aircraft that have penetrated the outer defences. As one can imagine, in a full-scale war situation in the Missile Age, such as this one, fighters are usually the last line of defence because you don't want friendly aircraft mixed in with enemy aircraft. The missile may know where it is and know where it isn't, but it doesn't really care who it hits or what side they're on. During the Gulf War and Operation Iraqi Freedom, more than one NATO pilot met their end via Patriot missile, and in Ukraine the same story has been seen with the S-100 series of SAMs. On both sides. In any case, the various weapon systems and their ranges overlap with one another, covering every single corner of your sky, creating a large air defense bubble over your controlled airspace, into which any bandit that ventures shall meet his doom. Theoretically, anyway. As though all of these weapons and their command and control were... integrated. Incredible. Alright. With that explained, let's go over what weapon systems are available to who, how they work and what they're for, and of course how they fit into the integrated air defense system, etc, etc. And as stated, we will start with Ukraine, although what is useful is that both sides are using Soviet platforms. As such, each breakdown I do of an aircraft will summarize the general capability of both sides. However, I must stress that in almost every case, the Russian variants will have advantages, most likely in technology, and I'll briefly go over that when I discuss the Russian order of battle. The Ukrainian Air Force began the war heavily outnumbered. Exact inventory is hard to say, so I'll use the figures available from February of 2022, however they're most likely not precisely accurate. The primary fighter interceptor of the Ukrainian Air Force is the MiG-29 Fulcrum. Ukraine's variant of the MiG-29 has gone through several major upgrades since it was originally introduced into the Kyiv military district's air defense during the Soviet era, but it is nevertheless still an analog fighter from the 1980s. Lacking the later modernization packages of Russian variants, as well as the more modern missile and radar systems. Another major issue is it doesn't have all the modern situational awareness systems available on the more modern fighters, meaning that it still operates as it was originally designed by the Soviets as an area defense interceptor, relying on AWACS, or ground control intercept, to steer them onto threats or their patrol route. That said, in the raw capability department, the MiG-29 as an airframe has truly outstanding performance, both in speed and maneuverability. Before the Luftwaffe retired their fulcrums, and during Ukraine's NATO exercise Clear Sky, as well as the efforts of Poland and Slovakia and other MiG-29 operation countries, it's been demonstrated that during joint training exercises with the United States Air Force and the US Navy, that in a BFM environment, that being close range with guns and heat-seeking missiles, the MiG-29 is equal to, and in some cases superior, to the F-16 and the F-18 if flown to the limits of their airframe. And, as Exercise Clear Sky as well as the war has shown, the Ukrainians are all about flying to the limit. During the onset of hostilities, the Ukrainian Air Force had between 40 to 70 MiG-29s available for service, with eight two-seaters for conversion training. However, due to the intensive maintenance cycle for older Soviet aircraft and the inability to readily source spares from Mikoyan for obvious reasons, actual operational readiness was most likely two-thirds of that. In fact, for all future legacy Soviet systems on this list, it would be safe to assume that the state of affairs applies to all of them to varying degrees, with the exception of homegrown modifications from Ukrainaprom. Anyway, on to the next aircraft. Supporting the MiG in the air superiority role while providing an accurate ground attack platform is the best aircraft in the Ukrainian inventory, the Su-27 Flanker. Built as a response to the F-15 and the last major aeronautics project completed by the Soviet Union, the Flanker has formed the bedrock of Eastern Bloc combat aviation for the 21st century. There are multiple variants and indigenous modifications of this aircraft in service all over the world, from Malaysia to India to China to half the developing world. It is very fast, very heavily armed, and above all is insanely maneuverable, to the point that until the advent of the fifth generation fighters such as the F-22, it was the most agile modern fighter in the world, and due to the sheer size and efficiency of the airframe compared to the MiG, the Flanker has a lot more capability as far as avionics, situational awareness, high technology, and radar is concerned, for a Russian aircraft anyway. Unfortunately, once again, the Flankers available to Ukraine, while having been modernized similarly to their MiGs, are not anything like as capable as the Russian airframes we will discuss later, such as the Su-35 and the Su-30. Nevertheless, they are still a very capable airframe, and are usually flown by Ukraine's best pilots. At commencement of hostilities, 32 flankers were available to the Ukrainian Air Force, six of which were two-seaters used for conversion and training, and specialist ground attack missions. 
Now, onto the most iconic and commonly seen Soviet aircraft during modern conflict and the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Flown by every former Soviet state, the Su-25 Frogfoot, or as it's known in Russian-speaking nations, the Rook, is often seen as the Russian A-10. However, it is in actuality the direct descendant of a concept that would ultimately define Soviet frontal aviation for the entirety of the state's existence. The IL-2 Stemovic became the most produced combat aircraft in history, and during World War II was described to be as vital to the Soviet Union as air or bread by a man with a rather magnificent moustache and a monumentally horrific government policy, which involved a lack of bread half the time. Two decades later, it was obvious to the VVS that the capability which had saved their country during the Great Patriotic War had ebbed away in the jet age, and that a new Stemovic was required. The Su-25 entered service in 1978, and has not changed much since then. It has received several modernization packages for GPS navigation, newer missiles, guided smart munitions, etc. The Russian ones especially, with their SM-2 and SM-3 block models. And it can perform every type of ground attack mission available except stealth or long-range deep strike missions, for obvious reasons. But really, it is the same old jet now as it was then. And in keeping with the IL-2, or to use a more familiar pop culture analogy, the Kalashnikov AK tradition, it is the personification of the Russian equipment stereotype. Is good, strong jet. Crash is okay, we fix with hammer. Is blown up, bring it back, we fix. Great plan, carry lots of bomb to drop on capitalists and enemies of the state. It's cheap, it's rugged, it carries a crap load of ordnance and it can hang around over the battle area and bring its pilot home from things he really shouldn't come back from. Downside is, despite Russia's best efforts, it's still not very high tech. It is almost entirely analog, with little in the way of battle space situational awareness or automatic targeting. It, it really doesn't have any of the high technology aids that modern ground attack aircraft have to prosecute targets. That said, of course, it still does the job. It still gets warheads on foreheads. But like the A-10, due to the nature of CAS as a mission, close air support for those who weren't paying attention, no matter how rugged it is, it also has the highest casualty rate of both air forces during the conflict. At the outset of hostilities, Ukraine had between 15 to 30 frogfoots on strength. But, to perform the more complex and dangerous deep strike missions that the Su-25 can't do, or a precision strike, or even just to carpet bomb an enemy convoy should the opportunity present itself, you need something special for that purpose. And both sides operate the Su-24M Fencer D. The Su-24M is the modernised version of, get this, the Su-24. Though, once again, modernization when discussing Russian aircraft is a uh, relative term, and is usually not to the standards required. The Su-24 is a variable geometry swing-wing aircraft capable of very high speed and very low altitude. It has the Soviet equivalent of PAVTAC terrain-following radar, inbuilt targeting pods for laser and TV-guided munitions of dubious quality, electronic countermeasures and jamming equipment, tactical reconnaissance equipment, and most importantly, a huge payload. It flies in low at supersonic speed, hits its target with precision, relatively, and then leaves even faster, jamming and flaring for its life. However, all that capability comes with a cost. And I will warn you, I am not afraid to make very dark jokes. When the United States Navy retired the Tomcat, there was a wave of depression that swept the world of aviation. No more shall we be venturing forth with those mighty wings into the danger zone. But it was in fact an economic safe zone and a absolute relief for the Pentagon, as not only did they not have to cover the huge logistical and financial overheads of the Tomcat, they didn't have to keep replacing the crew chiefs who kept throwing themselves overboard from the carrier or straight into traffic outside their office. Swing-wing aircraft from the 1970s are the most maintenance-intensive aircraft ever built. As someone who's friends with a few F-111 maintainers from the old RAF days or RAF days, uh, you know what I mean. And the Su-24 is no different. In fact, you are talking an inherently unreliable, maintenance-heavy design concept and then marrying that to Soviet engineering. You can probably guess how that went. Ukraine inherited around 100 of these aircraft after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and in February 2022, there were only 12 in service. Again, the Soviet Union built thousands of these aircraft, and the Russians only have 270, so draw your conclusions. 
The final tactical aircraft in the Ukrainian inventory, however, is something that the Russians do not have, and it is a very ubiquitous airframe. In fact, it's in use all over the world, and one of the most incredible aviation success stories in history. The Czech-built L-39 Aero is a trainer, tactical bomber, close air support aircraft, recon aircraft, aerobatics demonstration aircraft, and even an aerial cinematography aircraft used recently to film Top Gun Maverick. Its simplicity, reliability, and affordability has made it a popular low-cost option for air forces all over the world, and for countries like Ukraine with a limited budget, their fleet of 47 L-39s serve as both their primary jet trainer and in times of war, a CAS aircraft able to put warheads on foreheads in support of the front line. No mess, no fuss, no complicated weapons, no complicated systems, no nonsense. You just strap some dumb bombs dating back to 1965 that you've pulled out of a Lviv warehouse, roll in on the target, flaring all the way, release the bombs, and then hit the deck. It's an asset definitely worth more than the sum of its parts, and it's come in very useful. The remainder of the Ukrainian Air Force inventory are support aircraft or MIA transport helicopters and, of course, UAVs. Though, as the home of Antonov Airlines, they have a rather considerable airlift capacity for such a small air force, with an assortment of transports, both civilian and military, ranging from the AN-26 turboprop transport to the IL-76 jet cargo aircraft, all the way up to the massive Antonov AN-124 heavy lift transport. Although three of their Antonov 30s are used as electronic warfare and reconnaissance aircraft, but as I'm sure most of you watching know, the Ukrainian Air Force has one more combat aircraft in its arsenal that has been making quite a few headlines. The TB-2 Bayraktar UKAV. Not wanting to drag this out, simply put, it's a drone. Though not as large and as heavily armed as the MQ-9 Reaper, it packs a mean punch in a relatively small and stealthy and affordable package. The Bayraktar has a very good combat record and in the current conflict has demonstrated its ability to strike targets with precision. Ukraine had only recently started taking deliveries when the war started, and therefore only a few were put into action, but they punched well above their weight and the amount that they had on them. Delivery efforts have intensified in recent months to replace losses and to add to the capability, with 48 of them having been ordered, but that's most likely going to increase. As such, we don't have any exact numbers on how many were or currently are in service with the Ukrainian Air Force, but if I may show my bias, if it's not apparent already, even if I did know, I wouldn't say Fuck Putin and his cronies. And while we're on the subject of support assets, while they aren't technically what one would consider part of the air war per se, in the strictest sense, they are very important to the overall picture, so I must mention them here. The remainder of the helicopter force are attached to the Ukrainian Army Aviation Units, including 50 Mi-24 hind attack helicopters. The Mi-24 has provided the backbone of Soviet and successor states' frontal aviation, and for a lot of the world actually, since its introduction in the 1970s. All over the world, the Hind has shown its rugged toughness, heavy payload, and the ability to carry troops, and it is unmatched by any other helicopter. Armed with rocket pods, air-to-ground missiles or anti-tank guided missiles, a minigun in the nose, or a GSH 30mm cannon, it is probably the most successful complex weapon system the Soviet Union ever produced, as there is no airframe that can do the things it can do. And it is one of the few Russian weapon systems that NATO ground forces truly fear and train explicitly to fight against. However, they aren't as capable in the dedicated fire support role as the more advanced Russian attack helicopters dedicated to that purpose, such as the Ka-52 Alligator or the Mi-28 Havoc both being modern attack helicopters with capability akin to the Apache. The remaining helicopter force, of course, are support assets, 24 Mi-17 transports, 48 reliable Mi-8 transports, and 18 Polish Mi-2 recon utility helicopters. However, all of these can provide fire support with rocket pods and mounted machine guns. And forgive me for this, but aside from the Bayraktar, I'm not going to go into too much details regarding the specific types of UAVs used in this conflict, due to the simple fact that holy shit there are a lot of them. The Russians have something like 30 different models in use, as do the Ukrainians, and they range from everything from full-scale UCAVs dropping ordnance to the drones bought from Amazon flown by grunts using their phones. And amazingly, there has been a lot of crossover in their capability.
but we'll go into that later. In fact, we will go into the role that the drones are performing and their unique uses that they've been put to, but unless their model is specifically important like Bioductar or the Switchblade Kamikaze drone, I shall refrain from mentioning them because, quite frankly, this is a rather long video and it will go on forever if I do. It helps though that we have reached the final and most important component of this section. Surface-to-air missiles. SAMs. Throughout the Cold War, NATO's access to the international market via the wonderful world of capitalism, and not having to rebuild their entire country twice while trying to maintain an arms and a space race, had given them an edge in both A, money, and B, technology developed with said money, especially in the electronics and computing sphere. This gave them a sizable edge with recon aircraft like the U-2 and the SR-71, or fighters like the F-4 Phantom and later on the F-15 and F-16. Unable to match NATO head-to-head -head in the air, their realisation was that if you are on a ship or on land, you don't have to have all those fancy miniaturised computers and electrical systems. You can wring more performance out of the old analogue systems. And the Russians did have a speciality going back to the turn of the century. Mathematics and rocketry. Throughout the Cold War, the only area of real parity and even superiority that the Soviets had in the terms of the air combat sphere was their SAM systems, and this has carried on until the advent of the digital age, which coincided with the fall of the Union, surprisingly enough. But even today, they are still some of the most terrifying systems possessed by the Eastern Bloc and in service around the world. Starting with the long-range systems and working down, we have the S-100 series. The S-100 series are the equivalent to the US Patriot system, with the latest Russian variants being designed to fulfill a counter-ICBM role. They have a very long range, numbering in the hundreds of miles. They shut down entire regions of airspace in large batteries, supported by a variety of radars, most notably the long-range tracking and guidance radar codenamed Big Bird, and the low-altitude, low-radar cross-section, terminal guidance, clamshell radar. Ukraine is equipped with the S-300 series, Deployed in the 1970s and modernized throughout its lifespan by Ukrainaprom and Ukraine's former Warsaw Pact allies, their exact number is unknown, but they were the primary targets during the initial phase of the invasion for a very good reason. The Russians, likewise, have more modern variants of almost every weapon system Ukraine possesses, and has large numbers of S-400 and S-500 batteries closing off the airspace over the battlefront. Again, due to their importance and the proliferation of these systems, exact numbers are unknown and there is no way to independently verify them. That said, Warsaw Pact nations have essentially emptied their old stocks and donated them to Ukraine, as the US has backlogged them with Patriot. So it's safe to assume that both sides have managed to field a substantial number of the systems and maintain them. The most prolific SAM system in Ukraine on both sides, though, is the Kub and Book series of medium-range mobile systems. They were developed to provide heavy anti-air defences on the front line of a Soviet offensive through Europe. They are quick to move and set up, while being able to engage both fixed-wing and rotary targets at longer ranges. They are exceptionally useful, as they can be used both in a strategic and a tactical role, and these were supplemented by the more technologically advanced TOR system, developed in the 1980s with much more advanced targeting, multiple target engagement, and an inbuilt high-powered radar. Ukraine, at the beginning of the conflict, had approximately 250 to 300 of these three systems, the majority of which being the older Kub model, while the Russians largely operates an unknown number of books and tours, and once again, they have a lot of them. Finally, there are the shorter range systems. Both Ukraine and Russia are armed with the highly mobile Strela 10 tracked SAM and the 9K33 Oza wheeled SAM. Ukraine has around 150 of each type of system, while the Russians have closer to 400 of each type of system. But none of these aforementioned SAMs are the scariest system in the battle space. Oh no. That title is reserved to the Tunguska and Pantsir short to medium range surface to air missile and gun systems. Carrying the most modern radar gun systems available to the Soviet Union and later the Russian Federation, the Tunguska and the Pantsir are lethal at close range targets, especially drones. Their rate of fire and accuracy are terrifying, and in a pinch, they are even capable of engaging ground targets, just as their predecessor, the venerable ZSU-23 Shilka, has done for half a century. In fact, the Shilka too has seen significant service in this conflict, having been modernised and brought out of storage on both sides as the situation has deteriorated since 2014. 
However, the Tunguska and the Pantsia have one weapon that terrifies anyone in the combat aviation sphere more than anything. The 9M311 and 95E6 surface-to-air missile. Now, to understand why this is scary, I need to explain how a radar warning receiver works. A radar warning receiver, or RWR, is a sensor equipped in an aircraft which informs the pilot what type of radar is looking at him and when a radar-guided missile is fired at him. An infrared missile, like those fired from the manned portable weapons or a heat-seeking missile from a fighter, does not show up on the RWR, but is usually close enough to have a long white trail easily visible. To defeat these missiles, the pilot has access to flares, which create large heat plumes against cold blue sky in order to trick the missile into hitting those instead of the jet engines on the plane. And most of the time, the heat-seeking threat can be avoided altogether by flying at higher altitudes and keeping your distance from enemy planes by using radar missiles or long-range weapons instead. The Tunguska and the Pantsir, however, have an optically guided backup firing system. Essentially, the radar on the vehicle tracks the target and provides targeting information to the gunner. The gunner then locks on with the long-range optical sight, and then uses the onboard computer and stabilizer to keep the missile locked on the target visually. What this means is that the Tunguska and the Pantsir has longer range than the standard infrared missiles, and even if you throw chaff or flares out to try and distract the missile, the gunner can ignore these countermeasures and guide the missile in manually. So it fires further away, making it harder to spot because it has longer range than infrared systems. It doesn't give you a warning, and if you somehow try to evade it, the operator can override the missile and guide it onto you manually. You can evade this threat by flying higher, but given that there are S-300s and stuff around, that is a dubious proposition at best. So when integrated properly into an air defense system, the Kunguska and the Pantsir are terrifying. Unfortunately... The Russians have a near monopoly on those systems, though Ukraine has around 70 older Tunguska models and has managed to capture several of the newer ones. The problem for these, of course, is the ammunition. As while the Buk and Kub systems are relatively plentiful all over the world and you can have your stocks replenished, you can get some more, and maybe they even have domestic production, Tors and Tunguska munitions are almost exclusively Russian or Chinese made. Sourcing replenishment for those will be a lot harder. The only other system really left in the SAM section is, of course, man pads, man portable air defense systems, as mentioned before. And really, uh, I can't really go into that for the simple reason is, you know what, actually I can. I'll give you a quick summary. Here is the man pads in use in both sides of this conflict. Yes. As in, there is probably an example of every shoulder-fired anti-air weapon ever made in use by both sides of the war. Simply due to their affordability and them being one of the major pieces of military aid supplied by the global community. They're cheap, they keep them in storage, they have red eyes, stingers, Strailer 2, Strailer 3s, Iglers, Pyruns, Star Streak, you name it, they just have all of these things. And they have proven deadly effective. So that covers the equipment and the Ukrainian order of battle. So now, on to the Russians. As I said at the start of this section, the previous outlines given for the Ukrainian gear apply to most of the Russian aircraft as well, with the caveat that the Russian models are distinctly more modern and have far greater capability in terms of payload, weapon type, avionics, and subsequent performance. The new flight computers and glass cockpits present in the two-seat Su-30, for example, are a marked improvement on the original flanker design, providing the pilot with greater situational awareness, more advanced data link, and weapon employment, as well as having a weapon systems operator, or a WIZO, in the back to assist the pilot with task oversaturation. He can help the pilot out in employing weapons, detecting threats, etc. This comes along with a slew of upgrades, such as a more advanced helmet-mounted cubing system, a more powerful radar, more advanced missiles, and thrust vectoring for supermaneuverability. It can also double as an electronic warfare aircraft with jamming pods and the KH-31P anti-radiation missile. They have roughly 110 of these in service, alongside 100 modernized Su-27s and 100 of the newer Su-35 Flanker E's, which have all the same features as the Su-30, minus the WIZO and some of the payload capacity. Alongside these, the Russians also operate around 80 to 100 MiG-29s, again modernized, but not as aggressively as their flanker platforms, and as such they haven't seen much frontline service, suggesting they are primarily held in reserve. I also think that most likely because Ukraine's frontline fighter is the MiG-29, they want to prevent friendly fire incidents. 
But the Russians do have some aircraft which, due to their nation's size and relative wealth, although that's taken a bump recently, they have capabilities that the Ukrainians simply can't match. The MiG-31 high-altitude Mach 2 interceptor is one such aircraft, capable of employing hypersonic missiles, anti-satellite munitions, and long-range air-to-air missiles. But due to the nature of the war in Ukraine, these are unlikely to see much use until much later, if they see use at all. Although they might have seen use for the deployment of hypersonic missiles, but I can't confirm that. Likewise, the Su-57 Felon, the Russian F-22 equivalent, and I use that term very generally, has fallen behind in design and production efforts. While the Kremlin is unable to afford the exorbitant costs in fielding a large number of Generation 5 aircraft and all of that that would entail. As it stands, there are only six of these aircraft currently in service, and they are mainly being used for patrols or token strikes at the perimeter and for combat testing. They're not risking destruction and capture by Ukraine of these aircraft, which, should that happen, would mean that airframe ends up in US Air Force Base Ramstein in Germany by the end of the week. Nah. The real strength that the Russians have in this war regarding their air power is their strategic and ground attack assets. The first on this list is the smallest of them, and the most commonly seen one both in Syria and in Ukraine, the Su-34 fullback. The Su-34 is based on the flanker platform and is intended to fulfill the supersonic bomber role in order to replace the large, expensive and aging 270 strong Sukhoi-24 fleet, as well as the supersonic Tu-22M swing wing backfires. Again, that variable geometry technology is maintenance intensive and expensive so they want to get rid of it. The Su-34 is heavily armed, equipped with the latest technology available to Russian aviation in terms of avionics, weapons, and electronic warfare. It marries the larger and more powerful modern Russian equipment with the reliable and outstanding performance of the flanker airframe. It has proven to be the most effective of the frontline aviation assets in current conflicts, albeit with a higher casualty rate. And it is that fact which makes the next collection of aircraft the most important asset the Russian Air Force has in this war, providing them standoff capability. The Long Range Aviation Service, equipped with 15 Tu-160 White Swan supersonic strategic bombers, 42 Tu-95 turboprop strategic bombers, call sign Bears, and 66 Tu-22M backfires. They have been performing the vast majority of Russian sorties from day one of this campaign. The Soviet strategic bomber fleet was once far larger and mightier than this. Even so, this condensed and heavily modernized force has proven their lethality by bringing some of their most vital capabilities. Air-launched cruise missiles. With the efficacy of modern SAMs reducing the effectiveness of conventional air operations, these long-range strikes with faster cruise missiles have proven the best method for striking strategic targets in depth, and pose the greatest air threat to the Ukrainians as they simply can't counter it. The most prevalent missile we have seen is the Calibre cruise missile system, which does have an air-launched variant, though due to the intensity and the number of sorties, it's safe to assume that all currently active models of air-launched cruise missile are currently being used. To carry out the invasion of Ukraine, the majority of Russia's modern air forces were committed to the campaign. However, the Moscow military district and the Syrian expeditionary force maintained some of their strength, while older airframes based in central and far eastern military districts have been kept in reserve. An exact number of aircraft and squadrons can't be given simply because that information is classified, and the majority of public information are that of paper figures, which, given the track record of the Russian Air Force, I mean, excuse me, the Russian Air Force over the past decade, I don't believe those figures for a moment. But we have been able to put together a rough order of battle based upon what we know. The Russians committed three full air armies to the invasion, consisting of 4th Air Army, the 6th Air Army, and 11th Air Army. They are supported by the 37th Air Army, which is the long-range strategic aviation force. I couldn't find updated modern tables of organization for these, so the aircraft type and base location is out of date on this example here, but this shows the basic outline of a Russian air army. Between 6 to 8 regiments of aircraft, numbering 2 or 3 squadrons per regiment. They are supported by between two and four missile regiments, usually armed with S-400s, and their attached short-range Panzer elements. Aircraft squadrons usually number around 12 aircraft, so removing the 37th from the picture, as they have a unique structure, and averaging out at two squadrons of 12 aircraft across seven regiments, gives the total air strength of three air armies at roughly 500 aircraft, 
with around 80 strategic bombers on top of that from 37th Air Army, which amounts to roughly 75% of Russia's combat strength, the majority of which being its most modern systems. These are backed up by the support aviation assets sited at nearby airbases, including a squadron of A-50 AWACS to provide situational awareness, command and control and air intercept, along with a squadron of IL-78 tankers to keep air operations running continuously. And of course, these figures don't include the frontal aviation assets comprised of KA-52 Alligators, MI-28 Havocs, and MI-24-35 Hinds, assigned to their own independent squadrons and the air assault forces. They are of course supported by the MI-17 and MI-8 squadrons, which number hundreds or maybe even in the thousands of helicopters. And due to the heavy focus on air assault and airborne operations by the Russians during the outset of the invasion, most of the inventory of attack and transport helicopters were most likely in attendance. As one can see, the balance of forces in February of 2022 were decisively in Russia's favour across all metrics. Victory should have been assured. But if one may allow me to torture an old idiom, it's not the size of a dog in a fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog in a dogfight.